the big Charleston contest. I am uh, Stefano. I am an Italian man. You've reached the house of unrecognized talent. I've been dang if I know where you young folks get all them newfangled ideas. Who cares about life? Who cares about me? Not me, that's for sure. I think it proves you're all daft. I suppose we're getting into trouble for saying that now. Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. We're all pretty bizarre. Some of us are just better at hiding it, that's all. Well, New York City can dig it, because we're number one! All people, everybody's continually searching for love. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. A girl can be someday a lady, and a boy can be someday a man. Domo arigato, Mr. Scotto. You never get it right, do you? You're either crawling all over them, licking their boots, or spitting poison at them like some Benzedrine puppet. Just trying to enjoy myself. Well, Oakley Duck, um, here I am back on campus at lunch. Uh, i got a few minutes here, and I wanted to just talk about something. I'll try to put it in a, in a the- theological context. So anyway, just in a few minutes today, I want to I focus in on something that kind of hopefully overrides everything that I do. And we, we talked about this uh, briefly when Paul, in the book of Acts, when he goes to Thessaloniki, goes to Thessalonica, and Berea in Acts chapter 17. And a lot of this, what I do is built on Acts chapter 17, uh, when he, Paul preaches to them, and the Bereans particularly say, um, they search the scriptures daily. Scripture tells us, the Holy Spirit tells us, they search the scriptures daily to see whether the things Paul said were so. Now, that tells us a couple of things. One, they didn't just take Paul at his word. They did check the scriptures. And two, it means they could check the scriptures meaning Paul at that time would have been referencing Old Testament truths, including the law, including the prophets, uh, including the patriarchs, etc. And that's what Paul would have been referring to. And we talked about that a lot, that that's what Paul's ministry was in the book of Acts. And we know that from his trial, he attested he, he preached nothing that wasn't taught by Moses and the prophets, which is the Pentateuch, um, the Torah, and the prophets, which includes the Psalms, etc. So anyway... <clears throat> But also in there, and part of that is the Thessalonians, Paul, Paul reasoned from the scriptures. And I want to talk about that word reason. We talk about this a lot. A lot of the, again, my theology is not 100% in stone and never changing. We just learned about that in our last couple of uh, podcasts where we looked at 1 Corinthians 6 from a couple of different angles. But what I was doing either way was I was reasoning. I was reasoning, just like when somebody says to me, we're an Acts church. Okay, let's look at the Bible. Let's reason. Is that what you're doing? You're really doing what they're doing in the book of Acts. You just like to say that. Or I follow the red letters of Jesus. Do you? Here are some red letters. Are you following those? No, you're not. And there's nobody that is. I can guarantee you that. Uh, and we find one guy who's trying, but it's not happening. Or somebody who thinks they're keeping the law. Or somebody, somebody who thinks that they're, they're um, tithing correctly. We talked about tithing not too long ago as well. But I'll talk about this reason in a, in a greater context, particularly in theology, of course, but in a greater context. And first of all, one of the things you should reason is you have limited intelligence like I do. So reasoning means you are capable of error, and we all are. Pope's capable of error. A lot of error, by the way. And the magisterium's capable of error. And you know, we've covered that, the house of cards that is the election of the Pope. And, and the Pope assigning the cardinals. No, appointing the cardinals. Anyway, I want to bring this over into politics for just a little bit. Now, first of all, this is my disclaimer. And here's my proof. And you can look this up. This is public information. But there it is if you want to freeze it. Michael Scotto Party Libertarian. <laughs> okay, I'm a libertarian. I'm registered as a libertarian. Now, I'm a Ron Paul, Rand Paul sort of libertarian. And I told you that Ron Paul, uh, who ran for president, is a libertarian. And I actually ran into him, literally, uh, when he came here to speak at the university when I was a student in 1988, in that fall, when he was running for president. Uh, and he was speaking here, and he was coming down the hall with his entourage in the, in the Bryan School of Business, where I got my degree. Bryan Scholar, thank you very much. Graduated cum laude. And uh, he was coming down the hall, and there was this guy, and then an entourage behind him. And they came right up to me and kind of ran through me and around me, and I was right next to, to Ron Paul. So anyway, um, but Ron Paul, he's a pro-life libertarian uh, he is for personal responsibility. Libertarianism is not libertinism. Um, some people 
use it that way, but that's not what it is. Anyway, I'm not here to preach the Libertarian Party. Do what you want. My gripe today in reasoning is, first of all, it's theological. Meaning some of the things I've already mentioned. And some of the things that, uh, on, that's one side, the charismatic side, so to speak, about the Book of Acts. But on the Reform side, we've talked about that a lot. You know, if that's what you truly believe, if that's what you truly believe. Now, just as a, a parenthetical thought here, you know, I talked about R.C. Sproul recently a couple of times, and I did a, I did a previous podcast in season one or two on him uh, about his message on the outer darkness, the weeping and gnashing of teeth, which I thought was just theological nonsense. But nobody's going to question him because he's R.C. Sproul. Nobody in the audience is going to raise their hand going, uh, Dr. Sproul, what's a really... You're in fire. You're being tortured by God. You have no hope. Who cares if you're crying or gnashing your teeth? What's the difference? <laughs> right, but he makes a distinction, and he thinks he might be the one weeping because he doesn't know his eternal fate. Right? It's a denial of the gospel. And he claims to defend so harshly. Anyway, we've covered that. <clears throat> but again, it's just illogical to me. It's not reasonable. You know, like There's so much of Catholicism that it's the reason I came out. It's when I started to read the Scripture, and I started to reason from the Scripture, and I needed answers for things. Again, I don't have every answer under the sun. I can't answer, I can't explain every single verse in Scripture. But I try to give it its context. I try to look at it as the whole. I try to reason the best I can that, that lays out consistently, consistent, when we talk about consistent dispensationalism uh, across the board, differentiating from other kinds of dispensationalism. Don't you love our uh, poster back here about respect sacred and save sacred lands? Okay. <laughs> Their religion's important. What about mine? Uh, anywho, um, but it does cross over into the political. Now, again, uh, I saw, I've seen this in other ways and other forms. Now, I'm going to talk about this very briefly. The cartoon, and I might just, I'll put it up here somewhere. I want to cover that, and I'll put it up over here. <laughs> uh, that you know, has the Egyptian slaves, and they're saying, oh gosh, I'm glad I'm learning valuable skills uh, that I can use. If I ever, you know, to go build pyramids somewhere else. Well, yeah, I mean, nobody cared about this teaching until that one line. They had to find one line in the Florida guidelines for teaching um, American history about slavery. That's standard. That's standard. Um, I don't have it with me, but uh, I, I did post it, that the AP, AP, College Board, AP, African American Studies. Now, if you know who runs the AP program, or has run the AP program, at the college board, this is uh, one of the primary guys there uh, in terms of American history, is an anti-American. Uh, the curriculum is very anti-American. Uh, part of the coursework is to for students to identify with the enemies of America and react to America. That's what he does. Well, part of their curriculum clearly states that many slaves, while slaves, learn skills. They learn painting, they learn woodwork, as well as agrarian work. Okay, and they used some of these skills when they got free. Okay, it's just a common sense reason. Makes perfect, perfect sense. But that's part of his curriculum. That's what he has in there, right? But now that it comes out in one line in this giant set of uh, Florida guidelines for teaching history, particularly about slavery, now it's satanic. Now you have to jump on board and say, Ron, Ron DeSantis is a secret Klansman or whatever. All right, well, don't, don't live in Florida then. I mean, that's a great part about what we should get back to in this country is uh, the states, states having rights. But it's nonsense, because like I said, the, the most left-wing, America-hating, curriculum-guiding guy in for the college board and AP African-American history, that's what they teach. And of course it makes sense. Now, let's look at the logic of it. If, if, I'm, if I'm helping, if I'm being enslaved to build a, a pyramid, well, building pyramids wasn't a full-time job. The Egyptian economy didn't run on, this is my, my business degree coming out. The, the economy of Egypt did not run on building pyramids. But let's say it did. Let's say the primary function of the Egyptian economy, the thing that drove the Egyptian economy, was the building of pyramids. Okay, suddenly you have all these slaves, Israelite slaves and others, but Israelite slaves, and they're freed. God frees them, and they stay in Egypt. And the, and the Pharaoh decrees that they're, they're free. And it's illegal to enslave them. Okay, now your economy is still dependent upon building pyramids. Well, who's going to do the work? Well, you need the architects, you need the foreman, you need the labor. 
to build the pyramids. Where are you going to get that? You're going to get that from people who've been doing it, right? So they're going to have to drive your economy. You're going to have to pay them now. And now you, but now you have a, you have a supply and demand change for labor. You always had the demand for labor, but the supply was slaves. Now the supply is free men. Following this? Right. Now that's stupid because there is, that wasn't their economy. But in an agrarian economy in the South, where most of the, the work done, but not only that, the housework that was done, uh, by the house slaves, where they learned cooking skills, uh, they did learn painting skills, they learned woodwork skills, other skills that they learned as slaves. Now, again, uh, the, they are all freed. Do these, do these go away? Does the need for these things go away? No, it's still an agrarian economy. They still need agrarian labor. So now you have a labor market that's changed. The labor market now does not allow slavery. Uh, now you lose your housing, okay? Now that, oh God, you're saying it's great because they had housing. I'm saying it's great in housing. It's just a fact of life. If you're, if you're living it, now you have to pay for your housing or whatever if they're going to put you there. But that's what happens. You get paid. As a laborer, now, I'm not saying the system was great or perfect or anything. I'm just telling you that, yes, the skills they learned while in enslavement were then when they were freed, the skills they had to fall back on in an agrarian economy, or if they wanted to move to the north, which was less agrarian, more industrial, they took whatever skills they had, uh, maybe as painting, maybe as woodwork. I mean, they built things, right? If you had, if you were in the south and they, they built homes and things like that. So they weren't the architects necessarily. Uh, but they worked with the architects, and they did the labor. So they learned how to build. Okay, again, none of this says slavery is great. It's just a fact of learning skills. Again, if if you took me and and beat me daily, but uh, taught me how to be an engineer and didn't pay me, and fed me uh, you know spoonfuls of sugar, <laughs> making the medicine go down every day, and then you freed me one day and I had engineering skills. If I use those engineering skills, is that saying that the previous 20 years, 25 years of my life was awesome? Let's bring back beating Michael. No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying I happened to learn a skill. Yeah, they, they could learn better. They were limited in the skills they could learn. We know that. <laughs> but it's, it's just a fact saying some of the skills they learned while they were slaves, they then used to feed their families <laughs> and be employed afterwards. It's all it says. It's one freaking line. And the AP has been using that. The most left-wing, anti-American, American-hating college board guy that's what he was putting in the ap african-american curriculum now let me turn on the other side turn on the republican side again i'm not saying everybody's doing that but that's where the critical thinking needs skills come in because i actually spend most of my time uh because if i'm on the libertarian end of things we're considered right wing right because people have to label you but if i'm on that end i'm running into other people who are considered that and again, I spend my time correcting them. There's a lot of crap they put out. They put out these stupid, um, they put out these stupid, um, <clears throat> memes and other things, pictures of Photoshop of Michelle Obama looking like a man and that kind of thing. And I go and I find the original, this is a lie. Get it down. This is a lie. Let's stick to the issues. Let's talk about Michelle Obama's issues as what she wants to do. Not these fake pictures of her as a man. Right, that they try to, whatever they're trying to sell. Okay. And uh, among other things, too, there's a lot of other things, memes on the right, that are just bad reasoning. They're bad logic. They don't follow. You know, how come we can do this in school, but we don't do this? Well, it's not, one doesn't follow the other. Okay. So I'll correct them, too. And I do it mostly theologically. Most of what I do, I don't, because I don't like to dip my toe in politics, unless it's a big picture thing, like, let's deal with reason. Mostly it's, it's theological, because I get a lot of people on my side, evangelicals, that have to throw in hell and everything, and they got to threaten people with all that, and you know how I feel about that. So I have to ask them some questions. Okay, why doesn't Paul, somebody I like, like I said, but she finishes her podcast, her, her outro, mine is something from my band, uh, but her outro is some preacher going, it's the only thing, Jesus is the Christ is the only thing that will keep you out of hell, you know, Southern man. And I had to write, and I said, well, if that's, if that's the main teaching that we want to get across, why does Paul, in 14 epistles, uh, more than anybody else in the New Testament, primarily the doctrine we all stand on, one way or the other, now I stand on it, this last seven epistles of Paul, but one way or another, the Pauline uh, theology is, is all through the church, uh, good, bad, and ugly, all through Christendom, in any which way. But anyway, here's Paul. Paul mentions Hades, 
and you count that nearly one time. It's 1 Corinthians 15, and he, he mentions it in, in the context of resurrection, in the context of unbelievers are burning in hell. No, no, no. He mentions it in context of resurrection of believers. Where in resurrection, that's when we say, grave, where is thy victory? Right? The grave. Hades. That's it. That's Paul's use of it. Right? Now, in, in the book of Acts, uh, in Peter's preaching, I think Paul might do it there too in Acts 13, or, but certainly Peter does. Uh, when he stands up and he says, he quotes from the scriptures, uh, what the Lord said, will not leave your soul in Hades. Right? That's a reference to the Lord. Oh, Jesus went down to the fires of hell and preached and preached. No, he didn't. <laughs> it says he was in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. That's where he was, in the belly of the earth three days and three nights. But who he was, his essence, was in Hades. Like when we die, our essence, it's the state of the dead. When I die, I am hit, my life is hidden Christ with God, my resurrection life. My body will die, go to the earth. But who I am will be hidden in Christ. But it says, those Christ was in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. His spirit he gave back to the Father. Remember, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And then he breathed his last and died. Right? That was his life. The life force, that spirit. And went back to the Father in heaven. So now you've got Jesus in heaven. Jesus in hell preaching. And you've got him in the heart of the earth for three, day, for three days and three nights. Because that's what scripture specifically says about him. He was in the belly of the earth three days and three nights. So now you've got a triune Jesus. So now you've got five parts of the Trinity. Right? No. No. His spirit went back to the Father. That was a life that God breathed into Adam. Adam became a living soul. He was a non-living soul. God breathed life into him and he became a living soul. A living soul, and that's who he is. And Jesus, who he is, who he is, never changed. But his body was in the belly of the earth. So when he rose from the dead into his new body, he got back resurrection life, who he was, never changed, the Lord Jesus. He's, to, he's the same yesterday and today and forever. Right? They love using that verse for out of context. That here it works. He never changed. He was always God, even in death. But his soul was in Hades. It was a state of the dead. And that's what it says about us in First Corinthians. So here's this great preacher, Paul, all through the book of Acts, whether he goes to Jews and preaches out of the Word, out of the Old Testament, which is what he does, he first goes to the synagogues, or he, or he talks to Gentiles and doesn't go to the Old Testament in Moses, right? He preaches reason with them. Like, you have a, you have a many, I, I perceive you're a superstitious religious people, you got a lot of religious items around here. But here's one that says to the unknown God. Let me introduce you to the unknown God. That's where he starts, the creator. Because the law doesn't apply to them. They don't care about Moses or the law. Because right? they're not under it anyway. But anyway, that's another story we've covered. So anyway, this is Paul reasoning from their position. And uh, so anyway, this this whole preaching of this hellfire and God will not get you, you know, it's, it's absent from Paul's preaching. Go through the book of Acts. Good luck. Go through his epistles. Now, people are going to try to find it in there, but the only fire we talk about in there is judging the works of believers. You know, that the Bema Seat in Corinthians, we all stand before the Lord and our, our works will be tested by fire. Now, again, the testing by fire in Scripture is obviously metaphorical. So when you think about the lake of fire, think about that. And other fires you see in Scripture. Okay? But it clearly, when our, 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 and it says they'll come out either wood, hay, and stubble, which they'll burn up, or they're gold, silver, and precious stones, and they'll survive the fire. Now, obviously, those are metaphors for selfish, carnal works done in the flesh or those that will withstand the judgment of God. It says, but we'll be saved, all of us, even the one that loses everything, does it, but he'll still be saved as if by fire. Right? So he'll, he'll, the life you have cannot be hurt by the fire. It comes through. But again, that fire is metaphorical. It's the judgment of God. The judgment of God. It's just a little tidbit for you when you get to fire in Scripture. You've got to be careful. And there's sometimes there's literal fires in Scripture, and a lot of times, though, when in that context of judging and those sorts of things, it, it's, it's metaphorical for God's God's cleansing fire judgment. Right? So anyway, we got off on that, but you can't you can't get hell out of that because it's again the context is believers. Even if you want to, so again, I don't deal a whole lot actually with the left. I don't follow them, but occasionally if I see something, because there's no use it when you when you're signaling when you're virtue signaling. Nothing's going to affect your virtue signaling. Okay, you got to make sure the whole world knows that you're the good guy. And the way you be the good guy is to make the other guy evil. The other guy's Hitler. Everybody who disagrees with me is Hitler. Right? Everybody who disagrees with me is Hitler and Satan. Both sides do it. And then they start throwing the names at you. You're a racist. You're whatever. 
Okay, so that's my only deal. You can't you can't appeal because you're just going to get called a name, right? And, and anyway, I know it's a big blanket, but again, I don't have time to go sifting through to try to find the few people that will have a discussion. But it's the same thing on the other side. I don't, you know, when I when I when I deal with them mostly because in in a weird way they're representing me when they put that stupid stuff because I think Obama was horrendous in a lot of ways as president and did a lot of damage. Now again, we've seen this talking about economics. The United States was, has, has had its credit rating downgraded for the second time. The first time was under Obama, now it's been downgraded again. The United States credit, the credit of the United States in the world has been downgraded twice, once under Obama and now under Biden. That's serious stuff. And then they asked Janet Yellen, and she's like, I don't know, that, I don't know. The economy's so strong. Yeah, that's what they just downgraded it for no reason, right? No, it's, it's the debt, the level of debt, why did the housing market crash? Because they started a policy, which was debated, you can find the debates online, where Republicans were saying, you're going to crash the housing market. And they said, no, the housing market's strong as ever, you racists, you racists. Because they started forcing the government to give loans to people who had no business getting housing loans. And then they couldn't pay them, obviously, in the housing market. That's a simplistic way to put what happened. But that's primarily what happened. You can go watch the debates from 2000. 2000 Five and six, 2004, 2005, when they were debating, changing the policies at Freddie and uh, Fannie, Fannie Mae, and Freddie Mac. You know, oh, they've, they've never been stronger. You know, they nobody cares because you're t- they're told well, you're not supposed to care about deficits anymore. You care about deficits when you can call somebody a racist and hate them, but now you don't care about deficits anymore. Deficits aren't important anymore. Right? You're also anti-war until it's Ukraine and you're told that's a good war. So we're going to send. Hundred and fifty billion dollars over there. Talk about our teachers need more and our schools. Okay, well, there's one hundred fifty billion dollars gone. Right. Same thing with the uh, sanctuary city. I can't believe those people in Brownsville, Texas. They're a bunch of racists. We're a sanctuary city. Okay, here's all. You can have them all. We don't want them. Get them out of here. We're going to ship them off to somewhere else. How dare you send them here? Yeah, there goes your sanctuary city. We can't afford it anymore. Well, Brownsville, Texas has been dealing with that for forever. Right. Again, this is just reason. And I can do it to both sides. I can do it to both sides. That's why I'm a libertarian. Right? Again, I just want to worship my God as I see fit. Raise my children in a safe environment. Raise my children as I see fit. Educate them as I see fit. And not be forced, forced to do things communally Right, that's going to benefit people at the very top who continually get wealthy and more. Get, again, I'm going to finish with this. Given those people have been in politics forever, look at their net worth. How are they worth tens and twenties and hundreds of millions of dollars? How is that possible? Making what they make. Engineers make more than that. They're not multi. They're not all multi-millionaires. And you're going to come on TV and tell me how great the economy is, how great I'm doing. Even my gas bill's going up, my electric bill's going up, my water bill's going up. Right? My wages aren't keeping up. I go to the store going, my God, I can't, I can't buy that anymore. Where, you know, <laughs> start shopping around, supply and demand, you know, and then when, uh, now I'm getting economics, and, and then when inflation starts coming down, well, yeah, because the economy's cooling off because people aren't spending. But they're printing, I mean, printing trillion, printing a trillion dollars or more, how many trillions are they printing? Of course they're going to devalue your money. Right? But, but it gets out of control because now they're stuck. Now they have to print it, because if they stop, there's going to be a major shift in the economy they don't want to deal with. So again, they just keep building the house of cards higher and higher and higher, and someday it's going to have to collapse. And we talked about the collapse of America. Anyway, and it, that may come sooner than later, because the world economy, which is, which is using the dollar as its basis for value, particularly in the energy markets, oil, natural gas, they're looking to get out of the dollar. They're looking to switch out of the dollar. They switch out of the dollar, dollar becomes even less valuable. Inflation is even worse. The money you have is worth even less. Very easy. Economics 101. <laughs> it's a lot more complicated than that, but, you know, that's just the basic of it. Anyway, I'm going to stop there. It went longer than I wanted to go. But it comes back to just reasoning from the Scripture. Just like I said with 1 Corinthians 5 yesterday. You read that, that's believers. That's believers doing all those wicked things. You can't get around it. That's not what believers do. That's not what believers do. Of course believers do that. Believers can do all kinds of wicked things if they walk in the flesh. That's why we're told to walk according to the new nature. Walk according to your calling. Not only not in the new nature, but the calling to which you've been called. Don't go sacrificing sheep. 
Don't be worried about your tithing, all these things that are for another age and another calling. That's why we talk about this here a lot. We talk about our calling. We talk about the heavenly hope as opposed to the earthly hope, not mixing up earthly and heavenly things. Because we need to be walking not only according to, uh, not only according to the new nature, which is that power in us, the resurrection power in us, that new nature, that Holy Spirit, small h, small s in us. Right? Not only that, we are to walk according to our calling. So you walk in your new nature, and you actually empower the flesh when you walk in the old nature, not only carnally in terms of, you know, food and sex and those sorts of things, drugs or whatever, that's carnal. But also, if I'm, if I'm doing the ordinances that have to do with the earth, and then I feel good and I get pride. We talked about the Lord's Supper recently, the Plymouth Brethren and the Baptists and whoever, and, and baptism itself. And these carnal, earthly ordinances that have to do with the earth. They're just like the feasts. We don't celebrate, well, some people do. <laughs> but most people, you don't celebrate the feasts of Israel. We don't. They just have those two ordinances. But it's the same thing, because those ordinances are tied into Israel's hope. So if I'm going around doing the feast thinking, I'm wonderful because I practice the feast of Leviticus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. You say, no, that's not. God's not pleased with that at all. It's the wrong calling. Same thing with the ordinances. It's the wrong calling. And we just get pride out of that. we got to be careful. So anyway, I've attacked everybody in the sun today, but I'm the worst of all. I hate myself. <laughs> Small age, but I hate myself. Yeah, I wish I was much better than I am. I wish I loved more than I did. I wish I was better with everything than I am. I, you know, but I know I'm. I'm and I, you know, I know my mind is limited. I can, you know, I study to do my best, but I can be an error. Um, and I do my best with my wife and my kids and with my family. I try to love. I try to do the right thing. I try to walk in my new nature. But again, until we get our resurrection body, we're always going to struggle. Always going to struggle. So let me finish on that positive note. I have thirty minutes. And do a land claim wherever your land is. Go do a, go outside and do a land claim, and then don't give the, the, the land back to anybody. But you feel good because you did a land claim. I want to recognize this land once belonged to the Choctaw Indians of North Carolina. My house is sitting on land that was stolen from the Choctaw. You gonna give it back to them? Well, no, but but I acknowledged it, so I'm a good person, aren't I? By the way, that's your car in my driveway too. I stole your car. That was your car, but I stole that car from you. You're gonna get the car back? Nope, nope, nope. Like the car too much. But I acknowledged it, so I feel good about myself. Okay, that's how unreasonable these land acknowledgements are. <laughs> Just look up Ben and Jerry's land acknowledgement. <laughs> have fun. All right, that's it. <laughs> so. Hope you're enjoying the beginning. I'll we'll try to switch them up a little bit. Not too much. Anyway, bye-bye. Go back to work. I gotta get back to work anyway. Let's get close to time. <laughs>